Alors, beaucoup de techniques, un peu de poésie aujourd'hui. Je, 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 je vais te laisser euh, simplement présenter, euh, présenter ton, ton sujet. Donc, euh, Lynn euh, nous vient de Boston et euh, travaille à, à l'EM Lyon, donc euh, l'EM Lyon avec qui, qui euh, on est euh, évidemment en collaboration sur ce, sur ce sujet. Et, euh, et je te laisse la parole, euh, donc euh, a priori pour une intervention en anglais. Donc, euh, on va suivre euh, avec, euh, avec attention et euh, les oreilles bien, bien ouvertes à ton, ton intervention. Merci. Hello. So, um, I apologize for the English. I will go slowly. Uh, there's a lot to look at, though. Um, I'm actually not talking about poetry so much as some, some creative work I'm doing in a class right now. So I hope you find it interesting. Um, why should business schools learn about artificial intelligence? This was a question that took me a year to uh, prepare myself to teach uh, as a subject. But one of the issues is that there's a lot of frightening press, scary press, um, saying that machines will take your job, you will, lose, you will lose your job, and you won't be technical enough to do another one. Machines will also destroy your business. Bias and algorithm, as we heard in the previous talk, will hurt you in various ways. Your bank won't give you a loan because they have done an algorithm that said that you're a bad risk. And also, in the business world, it's more like you're a loser if you don't get educated. You're a really horrible person because you just don't know what's going on in the technical world. I think that's bullshit, but there's some truth to it. So, for instance, my own school regularly posts these frightening facts on Twitter about how 85% of the jobs won't exist in 2030. Um, basically lots and lots of things to get you to go back to school to learn about artificial intelligence. Um, the press, also, Erwin Cario is a French journalist, and he, he published this bullshit bingo about the press around artificial intelligence that became quite viral. Uh, one of my students showed it to me, I tweeted it, he ended up translating it into English. It's uh, funny and very accurate. Uh, the, press is terrible about artificial intelligence, um, not helpful at all. Um, and there's a kind of tech lust, like a, just this very, um, we must get ourselves into artificial intelligence or our business is going to be destroyed, we, don't, we basically have no plan if we don't know about artificial intelligence. It's unhealthy and it's uh, affecting managers everywhere, CEOs, everybody says AI when it's just machine learning, it's not AI, etc. Um, it's super unhealthy. And even on the machine learning front, I had a student come to me and tell me that his client wanted a churn model for why customers were leaving their service, which is an algorithm that explains why people quit. But they hadn't done usability testing They hadn't done interviews with their customers. They hadn't done any of the easier things to do that are cheaper to find out why their customers left. So there's a kind of a, it's, it's happening too fast. So I created a class that was trying to teach the topic of AI to business students who are not technical. My other <coughs> classes require programming. This class did not. So it was an experiment for me to see if business students could actually keep up and learn something technical without programming. <coughs> so the first part of this course, of course, is for each algorithm, how does it work? This is incredibly difficult because there isn't enough introductory material about artificial intelligence right now. Um, there are some videos, there are a few books that are starting to be written, but everything <laughs> is really very, very technical. It's easier to show some applications because a lot of people are starting to create demos. I'm going to show you some demos today. And I wanted my students to think creatively about artificial intelligence, not... It's, I want them to think about product ideas that really use the artificial intelligence, not just build a churn model 
like some marketing application. Build a product that uses AI. Okay, that's a different thing. But then they have to understand the limits as well. Part of it is understanding uh, data training issues, as we've heard previously. Um, do we have the right data? Did we train correctly? How do we train with data? And they needed to experience that in the class. So I'm going to talk about a couple of applications we did that were creative for the purpose of illustrating to them how these things work. Some of you might know about word to vec it's, it's not a deep technique, but it's the first stage of a neural net that does text analysis. Um, it's be become very, very popular because it's sort of intuitively easier to understand than a deep network is. The concept of a word to vec is essentially we look at a text collection and we learn about the words that surround each word. So we understand the context of each word in the collection of texts. <coughs> this is an example from a, an accessible blog post about looking at each word in a sentence and coding it for whether it's a one or a zero, which is part of how we encode the, the vector representation. And we have two different sentences. We have we have some green words that are ones, and we have some uh, red words that are zeros. The green words occur in both sentences. That means there's something similar about those sentences. They have a lot of green words in common. Okay, so this is essentially word to vec is essentially a similarity algorithm for finding similarities in word context. So. What that means is that after you've built a model, that's as technical as we're getting today, after you've built a word to vec model using a giant collection of text, you can find words that are similar based on that algorithm that you've run on the text. So the Google News network, the, the Google News collection is a giant collection of news articles, which means articles in English in the newspapers, very specific kind of text specific kind of domain, right? If you type in a word into this online demo, you can see the closest words in terms of frequency, words that appear near that word, okay? So father, the word son is the most next most frequent word that appears. If you have a father, you have a son in the same sentence or in the same neighborhood, okay? Now, if you type in mother, you get a slightly different list of words. It's very similar. You can see the daughter, like son. Grandmother occurs next. This is in news, remember, journalism. Okay. But interestingly, for father, uncle is the second most common word. It's the third most common for mother. There's something a little different about the way mother is used in text, right? Brother is the third most common for father, but it's much further, sister is much further down the list for mother. <coughs> Wife appears with mother, but husband does not appear with father. This should give me some suggestion already that something about this text is biased in some way about how women appear in the news versus how men appear in the news. Okay, so this GIF doesn't work, so we're going to open it up here. One of the points that's interesting about, about this, this representation of words in space in word to vec is that you can do math on these vectors. So the most common example of math with these vectors is finding relationships the most common, commonly used relationship in the literature is king is to man as woman is to queen or queen is to woman. So they're related in space and you can sort of move over in space to find the missing word. So this, this is his little description of, of how to understand the space. What this is is, we call this an analogy when you do three of the words and you try to find the fourth, right? This is to this as this is to this, okay? So I'm going to show you some examples. 
So um, we have to know first that it's easy to find stereotypes because of these relationships that we've talked about where the, the news is not equal in how it treats the topics it's covering, okay? So uh, there's a good Polish blog post here about how Word to Vec works that's technical, but it essentially points out that if you say doctor is to man and then put in woman, you will get nurse, not doctor, okay? Here is a visual representation of some of these relationships with one word to vec model. Along the bottom, we have gender, so she, he, and then we have woman and queen. This is because we're essentially showing this is the women, this is the men, higher status up here. And you can see that these are essentially even. Woman and man, man is a little bit higher status here if you interpret this layout that way. Not too surprising to me. <laughs> Eris, air, okay. Here's another one that's more disturbing. This is poor and rich with gender at the bottom. So we have men are priests, plumbers. Actually, it's secretary, it's strange that it's here. There's something that's going on in the news there. We have women over here, prostitute, next to homemaker. <coughs> that women are prostitutes, men are not. In the, in the past. Right? So let's go try this. This is actually an interesting. Um, if I can get it to render. Ah. To load. Although I just loaded it, so maybe it will work. Ah, it's, it's displaying down here. All right, so here we are. Let's go to the jobs one and try doctor and nurse. So, jobs. This is the jobs one, so prostitute, homemaker. Let's try doctor, <coughs> nurse. Doctor, nurse. Doctors are richer and more men. Nurse are po nurses are poorer and more women. Okay. What was another one? Researcher, teacher. <coughs> this is interesting. So researcher and teacher, they're very, they're very even in this press, in this d data set, but researchers are richer than teachers by far. <laughs> I'm a teacher. <laughs> okay, scientists. Where did scientist go? <coughs> scientist is up here. Scientist is rich and male. That's very much the way the newspapers handle science. Okay. All right. So the analogy question. So if you type in um, woman is to virgin as man is to what, what do you get? <coughs> you get this weird, interesting result because it's the news. The papers are talking about Sir Richard Branson, Virgin Atlantic, and his company. So this was an interesting experiment because I had students who tried these words in a different model and got interesting different results. But this one, based on Google News, is it's all about Richard Branson and men who are running companies. So I asked my students to do other analogies. This is the other tool to look for bias. And this is, a, this is not a very negative one, but it shows you German is to beer as Italian is to pizza. It's not surprising. Right. Woman is the wine drinker as man is the connoisseur. She drinks it, but he knows what he's doing. <laughs> totally offensive. 
French is too romantic as German is too platonic. <laughs> platonic is the opposite of romantic. <laughs> I had many German students and many French students in this class, so they were trying a lot of uh, cultural stereotypes. So um, they found a lot of great stereotypes in the data that were wonderful, but I also made them play with this tool. So to better understand the the process, let me find it. Here it is. Okay. So um, the unfortunate way the projector is making everything squishy. Um, this is a great tool from Google. Google is creating some of the best tools for teaching and understanding neural nets right now. This is a visualization of word to vec uh, one particular model in, in a dimensional space laid out by different algorithms. It allows you to see the relationship of words to each other. So for instance, down here, these are all places. Places occur in the same context in the news. Something happened in a place, something happened at a place, or whatever. Um, we can also search in this, so mother. When I search for mother, I can see the closest words, just like we saw the list before. Father is the closest word. Wife comes right after in this model. Parents, daughters, sisters, they're all grouped together in this space. The distance is short. So you can, in fact, zoom in and play with this and rotate it. Um, we can <coughs> see it spinning in space. These are times of the day and day. So afternoon is close to Sunday, Monday, weekend, morning, etc. All of these words about time. Also, strangely, funeral. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of thing that makes you go, what's in the news? Funerals happening at a time on the af in the afternoon. All right, so if you like that, I highly recommend you look at Google's arts and culture team in Paris. They're doing amazing things. This is a word to vec layout in TSNE, which is the, the algorithm we were seeing to lay out the words using images. So you can see that black images are all together here. We can zoom in on them and see them. Uh, it depends on your network speed, which we're now scuba diving, sorry. <laughs> These are all blue. Blue uh, pictures from museums, all organized. <coughs> They're doing a lot of work with these algorithms to figure out how to display giant collections, exactly what. So he does a search, model most similar this item and pregnant and gets results. These are similar style but for women who are pregnant. <coughs> All done with word to vec. So I'm going to switch now to talking about text generation which is um, a fun and interesting application that, the, that we all enjoyed in class that also raises some interesting questions about um, bias. <laughs> so first of all, there's a woman named Janelle Shane who is doing hilarious things, generating text with neural nets. Um, she's, she's basically taken big data sets that are lists and used them to generate new things in those lists. Um, Guinea pig, I don't know what it is in French, but these are great names for small furry pets. <laughs> Co cochon. Oh, sorry. So it's actually, it's exactly the translation. <laughs> um, so the band names is another application. These are getting a lot of press because they're fun. Especially if you're interested in business ideas, things that are fun and get press are an important read on the public, on what people are interested in. Just because it's funny doesn't mean it's not a good business idea at some point, okay? So um, one of my favorites of her lists was pub names, so bars in Northern England. Somebody gave her a long list. 
and it came up with some things that are some of them plausible, some of them not. Lick in is a little weird. <laughs> Loons Hall is possible. <laughs> um, old Hell Kick, not really plausible. Wallow Arms is very funny and sounds like Northern <coughs> England. Um, Crow's Rest is totally plausible, that could be one. Bell Inn, totally plausible. So this is one of the things that's interesting about these algorithms. They, they get very close to reality, but not quite. And sometimes you can make them more weird if you want, and you can make them less weird. She did it with beers too. This is a list of um, some of them very plausible dark beers. <laughs> Spore of gold. Um, these are weirder. Humble la bobstone barrel aged. Not not really plausible, but funny. <coughs> Triple thick back, possible. Triple lock, totally plausible. Dankering. So um, <coughs> it's always a case of the tool helps you get creative, and then you edit, you decide. So that's that's one of the ways that people are uh, using these kinds of tools. So. She did another interesting thing, which is to take knitting patterns, actual knitting instructions, and run the same process on them to see what it generated. And then she asked people to actually make them. And this is one pattern that's, I think, quite beautiful that was produced by the neural net. Okay. This is another one where that same process happened. So this is the original that the neural net produced, and this is the woman fixing it to give it the right structure for a pattern. This is really beautiful though. So I had my students do it. We collected a bunch of uh, data sets for them to try this. Uh, the, the most interesting one was this data set from Kaggle, vegan and vegetarian restaurants. So when we ran the algorithm on it, they, they got a lot of things with pizza. <laughs> Um, lots of things with cafe. Cafe food is a terrible name for a restaurant. Um, salad cafe is also a really bad name. Pizza and pizza, it doesn't know any better, it just says that. So, um, this, this gets weirder. The steak horror cafe, at this point I'm like, why is there steak in a vegan restaurant list? The cafe, cafe, it's also terrible. Um, the pizza den, and then down here, this was hilarious. My student, after she ran it, bar cafe, she thought that was great. <laughs> Same cafe, cafe, fart. No idea. There's just no restaurant that has fart in it. Okay, but then this also showed up. Chick, 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 chicken cafe. Chick, chick it sounds like the sound a chicken would make. But it's a vegan and vegetarian <laughs> restaurant. Why are chickens in the list? So this is also a funny, a funny name if you had a chicken cafe, but why is it in this list? So, so I went back to the list of restaurants and I looked for chick to see if there was something related to chick, chick, chick. There's a ton of chicken restaurants in this vegan and vegetarian data set. It's not very good data for a vegan and vegetarian list. Um, I mean, I got it off Kaggle, what could go wrong? But anyway, so there's a lot of chicken restaurants, which is why so many chicken outputs. And you can see also chickpeas, which is good. Uh, those are fine vegetarian, quashish chickpea. But then this, chicken and guns is an actual restaurant. <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> Garbage in, garbage out. This is the biggest lesson for my students. If you have data that's bad, you get a bad model. Always look at your original data. So we did it with uh, French names, and we got some very good ones. Some of these are probably real names. Um, well, uh, Alyssa, I know an Alyssa. Um, I think Elise sounds beautiful. Uh, Lutien is probably a real name, right? Lutien is a real name? Yeah, I think so. Um, Celias sounds like a disease, but it's pretty. 
Vix is a great name, to be honest. Um, Yudi is also a great name. Uh, the names, you know, as long as they sound good, it's okay. It's not like a restaurant. <laughs> French movies, we, it turned out we had, um, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, my favorite is La Vie, La Vie. There's like eight French movies called La Vie, La Vie, right? <laughs> Les Amours de La Vie, there must already be a movie like that. La Paris de La Vie, of course. <laughs> um, but we didn't have a lot of data for French movies. That data set was small. By the way, if you run into a big data set of French anything, send it to me. <laughs> There's another interesting um, tool that's getting press. Uh, Botnik Studios is doing models trained on, on text, essentially. They did this recently, so this is a lifestyle brand website based on lifestyle brands. Um, listen to your body. Your migraines are podcasts trying to be produced. <laughs> uh. Our famous doctor of candles, John Benjamin Expert, gives mental health advice to anyone having to let their wait staff go for the season. <laughs> it's really terrible, actually. Um, they also, they have apps, so you can make your own <coughs> using these trained models. So, for instance, let's do Harry Potter. The way it works, is it's trained for each word you get the mo next most recent words that could be and you can build a text so it depends on our wi-fi here <coughs> so harry ah, my mouse is not so if i type harry or click on harry it gives me the words that i could pick next so you construct a story using these frequency rules and they, they've been getting very fun and interesting results. They do a lot of hand editing and curation, I think, to make sure the results are good. But their Harry Potter, Potter novel is hilarious. It was written up in the papers all over the place because it's really funny. Um, this is too slow for the Wi-Fi right now, but you can play with it. So there are some somewhat serious branding companies talking about using these tools. Generate drug names with neural nets. This is an actual company that's making new drug names. This is not AI, but it could be. This is Create Your Own Perfume. It's a real service, a site, where you can go and enter your, the character ingredients, design the bottle. Stitch Fix is doing this with clothing. You could do this with perfume. So um, a few words about images. We also used this teachable machine tool from Google. So let me go here. <coughs> this is a little um, video demo, but I don't know if it's going to work over our internet. Um, right, so here I am. You're here, but you should see yourself. Three classes. <coughs> and then there's output. So this is running DeepLearn.js in the browser. <coughs> so what are we going to do here? We're going to teach it to respond with the cat GIF when I do something. So I'm going to do like this. <coughs> So it's taking screenshots of me doing that. Okay, so that's my result, kitty Jeff. All right, if you move around, sure. So it only ever picks this one because I've only got one class, right? So I have to teach it a second class. <coughs> okay. No hand. So this is images I've trained it with with no hand. Okay. Now when no hand is here, it brings up the doggy. 
If I put up my hand, it brings up the kitty. This is real-time machine learning in my browser using my camera. So if you have any doubts that your phone can do real AI and real machine learning, put them to rest. Okay. All right. So that's, that's enough of the demo, but I had some great results, including... <laughs> okay, that's the other GIF. So I collected some data from social media for a colleague who's interested in images used by whiskey companies to advertise their product. And I had my students do labeling in a Google spreadsheet so that I could train an image recognition model, a classifier. After, after they gave me four classes, I was able to run a TensorFlow model and get extremely good accuracy with not that many training samples. So this is people pouring whiskey into a glass and the model, when I run it on that, says people, 70% likelihood, bottles, 18% likelihood. It doesn't score high on glasses of whiskey, but it was trained on pictures up close of a glass, very close. So it's, in my opinion, doing the right thing. However, when I had students label data, I got some weird labels. So this picture of cats, which some whiskey company posted on <coughs> International Cat Day, the students labeled it as people at an event. This is, this is classic training data, bad labeling. It's like chicken restaurants and steakhouses in the vegan restaurants. Okay, so, um, Garbage in, garbage out. If you do a bad job with your training data, your model is shitty. So the students really learned that. There are obviously many, many creative apps using image, images in neural networks. Um, I don't have time to talk to you about them here, but essentially style transfer was one of the most famous. This is a guy who got internet famous for running pictures of dinosaurs merged with pictures of flowers and getting flower dinosaurs, and it's beautiful. Style transfer takes attributes of one picture and another picture and creates a, another picture. So it's a truly generative using input data, creative act from a computer. Now, um, that's beautiful. This is not. So this is um, face app. Apparently trained a hotness increasing app <laughs> to make people look better in their pictures and it's racist because it takes a black president and makes his skin lighter to make him hotter. This is one of those embarrassing, bad training, bad, badly thought out applications. The business people who run this company are thoroughly embarrassed by not having understood the training process and the results that the algorithm would produce. So um, I think it's incredibly important to teach students who are not technical, who are going to be running companies, creating products, employing people who build neural nets, what the, what the issues are and how these things work. We do need more teaching tools, so uh, I like showing demos and creative applications because it's, they're out there now and they're easy to explain in class compared to, compared to complicated mathematics. Um, every day someone is publishing a new article explaining how something works. I'm following all of the recent AI work. This is a post that showed up today, how capsule networks work. Um, but it has this picture in the middle of it. This is not an article I can easily give to business students. We don't have enough accessible materials. Now, um, some people are working on this. Distill.pub, if you don't know about it, is a publication that's an interactive technical publication from Google. So they essentially are publishing explainer documents that explain complicated technology with interactive tools. 
So the whole thing, the whole thing updates as you change your uh, demonstrations in the text. They have code you can run in a notebook. They have examples that are live that show you things that the neural network is doing with this image. This is really lovely work, and it takes a lot of time to create these apps, but uh, they're still pretty technical. So it's, it's a little bit difficult still for people to understand what's going on here unless they have a little bit of training. Um, but we're getting there. These, they know, especially at Google, I'm in a workshop in two weeks in Zurich that Google is running about tools for better user experience design, better design generally, and teaching these things. So um, if you like this kind of thing, especially the visualization side of this, I'm the co-chair of a conference in Paris in May. Um, it's probably a little expensive for students, but we're going to have student volunteers. You have to pay for your own trip to Paris, but you can work at the conference and get a t-shirt that says you're an employee there and then attend the talks. The conference is full of talks about data visualization, and three of the distill authors will be there, because there's a couple of talks on visualizing and understanding how neural nets work. Okay. Um, let me just quickly put up the... So the program has... This is, a, by the way, a French company database in Paris that does data visualization work on the web that's amazing. So, uh, beautiful work. We have OpenStreetMap. This is uh, one of the Google <laughs> talks. There are some things about uh, just how we have make charts and graphs that are fair, that don't have um, digital fallacy or statistical fallacies in them. Um, we have academics <laughs> giving Accessible talks, not papers. They're not giving a research paper. They're giving actual understandable talks. Some things on AR, uh, augmented reality. Um, and then there are workshops. <coughs> and the workshops are hands-on technical workshops. They're much less expensive than the conference, and you can register for them separately. If you don't go to the conference, you can still go to these workshops. So in particular, the coders, the uh, <coughs> There's some great coding workshops here, which are not all uh, advanced. They're, uh, although Epitech students would probably, if you're if you're good with your web frameworks, um, it'd be great. This one, the design one, designing data experiences, is, is a design workshop, not a technical workshop. <laughs> so um, highly recommended. And then after that. We're bringing the program committee for the conference down to Lyon to give a half-day free conference. And there will be uh, two, of, two people from Google talking about uh, the AI in the browser and visualizing it. So he's one of the distill.pub uh, authors, and Yannick is in the, the visualization team talking about deep learn. And then we don't have talk topics for the other three yet. So that's on May 17th in the afternoon. You can keep an eye on me on Twitter or on our website. At okay. So, uh, thanks. <laughs>
so that you didn't understand what you were doing, and places to allow the user to correct things. <laughs> These neural nets can update themselves, and any machine learning model can update itself if you collect corrections. So um, add, add a little button saying um, X or whatever, you know, and then, and then get input from people. Like, what, what was it if you got it wrong? And then it will get better. Um, that's one of the most important things, is to think about that data experience with, with getting things right and wrong. Um, 